Today we're going to host a webinar on some international finance. Um, we have our good friends from First National Bank, Karen and John, on the line as well. Um, but before we get to their presentation and um, you know who you guys are here to see, um, I will give a quick uh, plug about Scarborough. Um, this is brought to you by Scarborough University. Uh, Scarborough University was founded in 2006 in order to provide additional training to our staff and the trade community as a whole. We have uh, been starting here in the last year or so to do webinars every month, um, as well as a couple of seminars a year. Um, SCARU is also available to come in-house for any of you who have in-house training needs or would like something along those lines. Um, like I said, my name is Adam Hill. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Scarborough. Um, Scarborough is a group of five companies, and those companies service uh, the international trade community as a whole, from international freight forwarding and customs brokerage to warehousing uh, to some of our own asset-based trucks and some of um, some of our warehouses as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Karen and John to get us going. Um, please uh, ask questions. There's a, there's a Q and A feature. Um, on the um, webinar that you're currently on. So please ask them and as they come in, um, I will kind of keep them until the presentation uh, portion of this is over and we kind of open into the Q&A session to be about the last half of this. We will attempt to end right on time in order to uh, be respectful to everyone's schedule. So Karen, John, please take it away. Well, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Karen Pinkall and I'm joined with John McApinlack in our group here. We're going to for, um, we have quite a few slides, but we're going to go through them quickly and talk about payment terms and um, foreign exchange. Um, we'll go through them quickly, but then we want to make sure we allow a lot of time for questions at the end. Okay, so when we start talking to customers about payment terms and when they're dealing in foreign countries, things you need to think about are country risk. So things such as the current stability of that country. Are there any sanctions or embargoes? Does the country appear on any um, OFAC or SDN list? And is that country a uh, place where you might see a lot of fraud? In addition, you want to take a look at the customer risk. Is it a legitimate customer? Are you able to find information? Can you Google them um, and find out that they have a, a good looking website? It makes sense. Are they financially sound? Once you start doing business with these companies um, and start looking to do business with them, you want to make sure that you've asked for financials if you can get them ask for credit reports or trade references. Um, you can work with groups such as the Department of Commerce um, and other export agencies to help get those references. You also want to make sure that not only the country, but your customer does not appear on any OFAC or biz list, biz standing for the Bureau of Industry and Security. And I think the most important thing overall is to develop a good relationship with your customer overseas. Um, that relationship is very important as things arise down the road and you continue to grow. And then if you're using trade products such as letters of credit and documentary collection, it's important to know what the foreign bank risk is. The size, stability, integrity, again, is the bank on any of these lists? Is it a bank that you're not allowed to do business with um, due to U.S. sanctions? So the four main methods of payment for trade transactions are cash in advance, open account, documentary collections, and letters of credit. Obviously, cash in advance um, is the preferred way to do business internationally. Uh, the perfect way is to just get all of your money up front and then ship your goods. Um, it's the most secure. The buyer really needs to trust that the seller will make the shipment for the item first. On the other extreme, we have open account meaning the buyer doesn't pay for the goods until a specified date after shipment. It's the best form of payment for the buyer, but the seller needs to put a lot of trust that the buyer will, will make the payment after goods have been received. It isn't made, there is the big problem of collecting the payment in a foreign country if you don't receive that payment when you're supposed to. So those are the two extremes, cash in advance and open account. So next we're gonna talk about what's in the middle. So um, first we'll talk about documentary collections. These also are known, we, we see all kinds of names for them, whether they're site drafts or time drafts, DP meaning documents against payment, documents against acceptance, cash against documents. So if you see any of those terms, what they're talking about is a documentary collection. What happens is goods are shipped, the seller presents the shipping documents to their bank, 
and the seller presents the, uh, the bank presents the documents to the buyer's bank for payment. I have in green here that you want to make sure it's your international bank, meaning that you're working with a bank that has an international department and knows all the rules and regulations that surround documentary collections. So in this case, banks only facilitate the transaction. They're under no obligation for any payment. It's not a credit product like we're going to talk about. On a site payment, there are ways to help ensure that the buyer doesn't receive the goods until payment is made. You need, want to make sure all, all the documents, including the controlling docs, such as a bill of lading, an original invoice, all flow through the banking channels and nothing gets sent to the customer. Um, one small step above open account, um, because the customer has your documents, they sign something saying that they will pay at a later date, but if they are unable to pay, the bank really doesn't have much control to go after that customer. So again, bank, banks are only going to facilitate the transaction. They're under no obligation. So if you are the seller or exporter, what are the advantages? You keep some control over the documents. You keep the documents and have them flow through the banking channels so your customer cannot get those goods until they're pay for those documents, meaning they need to go get those documents in order to get the goods cleared through customs. What are some disadvantages to the exporter? You're shipping the goods without an unconditional promise to pay, so, so your customer could change their mind, and the goods are sitting in a foreign port if they do decide to not pay or not to collect, then your goods are sitting somewhere else. So the advantages for the buyer, they get to defer the payment until the goods have arrived. So the documents might flow through the bank, and they get to the bank in the foreign country, the foreign bank is going to tell them that the documents are here, and they might let that sit for a week or two until they know that the vessel has arrived and um, the goods are have made it to um, their destination. When would you not use the collection? Maybe for a first-time buyer in a volatile country, bank um, not with a reputable bank, one that doesn't have an international department, and um, probably not for large dollar amounts. When would you? It's a step down from cash in advance or a letter of credit. Maybe if it's someone you've done business with for a long time, it's a distributor, and in some of your more favorable countries and banks. Next, we'll touch on a letter of credit. A letter of credit is an undertaking issued by a bank for the account of a buyer or applicant to pay the beneficiary, provided that the terms and conditions of the LC are complied with. I think the most important part in this sentence is provided that the terms and conditions of an LC are complied with. If you do everything you're supposed to do under a letter of credit, payment is guaranteed. So that is the key point there. So letters of credit, also known as an LC or an, an, L, or an LOC, are issued for all kinds of reasons. Maybe if the exporter feels insecure with the buyer and his ability to pay, maybe the buyer wants it so they can finance against it. Um, and in some countries, they control movement of funds with letters of credit or trade finance products. And in some parts or industries, that might just be the way a standard way of doing business. So what happens? Well, when a bank issues a letter of credit, it's like a contract between the issuing bank and the beneficiary. The bank must honor and pay if the terms and conditions of the LC are met. The seller's no longer looking to the buyer for payment, but to the buyer's bank. But to make it binding, again, as I mentioned, all terms and conditions of the letter of credit need to be complied with. If they're not complied with, the bank is no longer on the hook for payment, and they're going to contact the buyer to approve it. So in this case, if it's discrepant, the letter of credit kind of turns into a documentary collection, meaning the bank is not on the hook for payment anymore. What are the advantages to the seller or the exporter? It provides an independent credit backing with a clear cut promise to pay. Instead of looking to your customer, you're looking to your customer's bank, and you might be able to find more information on your customer's bank credit ratings that you can get comfortable with. Payment is assured if the terms of the LC are met with, and it also can help protect from order cancellation. If you have a specific um, item and you want to make sure that if it gets overseas, no one can change their mind, a letter of credit is a good way um, to do business. Um, the advantages for the buyer or the importer, it assures that shipment was made according to the terms of the letter of credit and it is on time. You know, assure that the documents requesting the LC are provided and payment is not made until goods are shipped and compliant documents are presented or the buyer approves the discrepancies. I always like to give a good example here. We have a customer that was importing some goods for a specific Broncos game. Um, they charge 
order their themselves or shipment, they were concerned about shipment time. So they needed to know that their, in this case, hats with a specific Bronco's date on them would get in here in time. And if they didn't, they didn't want to have to pay for them. So they ended up using a letter of credit. So if those goods would have been late shipped, they wouldn't have been on the hook to make payment. So that was one example that one of our customers had used in the past. So we kind of looked at there are three contracts or three independent contracts to a letter of credit. The buyer and seller come to terms to buy or sell uh, some goods. The buyer goes to their bank and fills out a letter of, craft, letter of credit application. So in that part of the second contract, you, you could call it, the buyer and the issuing bank have some kind of relationship. After the issuing bank issues a letter of credit, it goes directly to the seller, meaning it's just between the issuing bank and the seller. And if the seller performs under the letter of credit, the issuing bank must pay regardless of what at that point has happened with the buyer. So there's two types of letters of credit. There's commercial letters that it and stand by. A commercial credit is a sales transaction taking place. So someone's importing and someone is exporting. There's typically a shipment that has taken place. A standby letter of credit is used if there's a chance of default. So an example might be a bid or performance bond, back lease and payments, guarantee loan repayments. Um, we see these predominantly more domestically than we do in the uh, international realm. Most of the LC standby LCs we issue are for domestic reasons, but they follow the same rules and regulations as commercial LCs. So they are housed typically in a global banking department. I think I mentioned most of that already. So here's a nice chart that just shows the, the, the risk from uh, minimum to maximum risk for the seller. Obviously the best way, we always tell people, if you get cash in advance, that's great. Um, then next, if you're moving up, up the chain for risk, is would be confirmed or unconfirmed letters of credit, site collections, factoring, forfeiting, uh, documents against payment, against acceptance, and then obviously open account. But that's a nice little chart that our customers like to have to refer to. So here's just a quick list of common documents you might see to a letter of credit. You know, a nice letter of credit might have three or four documents, but we see some that give a lot more than that. So that is a quick wrap up of um, international payment terms. Next, I'll turn it over to John McApinlack and he can talk a little about foreign exchange. Um. One of the key challenges for foreign exchange marketers when dealing with corporates is uh, the challenges of explaining the value of dealing in current in the U.S. dollar. So on the first slide here, uh, why deal in foreign exchange? If you're, uh, if you're actively managing your receivables and selling overseas, exporting overseas, it could create better margins for you because you're mitigating the risk and exposure associated with those receivables. Uh, one thing customers tend to do, especially in a volatile market, is, is hedge a portion of their anticipated sales and then add on as needed or adjust as needed to mirror their sales uh, for the next few quarters. Uh, on the import side, actively managing payables can lead to better cost savings. So uh, one thing that we try to tell customers to do is request dual currency invoicing. When I say dual currency invoicing, what that typically means is going up to your vendor and asking them to quote you in both U.S. dollars. What that does is enables you to essentially back into what their price is and determine whether or not it's more advantageous for you to uh, pay them in U.S. dollars or in foreign currency. Uh, another thing to consider is the pricing flexibility. So what you take when you are able to sell in foreign currency, it enables your overseas clients to compare apples to apples in pricing. Uh, so you know, how many units of, uh, of the product you're selling equates to their currency. Uh, you're also able to compete against the local presence. So if they're dealing locally and they're a large company, obviously they're gonna be probably be dealing in, in the local currency. So this helps you compete in that regards. And it also helps you compete with in-country competitors. So besides the US multinationals, Competitors that are in country are obviously invoicing in their local currency, so that assists your clients uh, in better determining pricing. But there are countries that only deal in dollars due to the restrictions, such as China, uh, Korea. Uh, so those countries are out there as well. A little bit of an overview of the foreign exchange market. It is the largest decentralized asset class. Trillions of dollars worth of currency are traded daily. 
uh, serves four primary functions for investments, hedging, and speculative purposes. It could be also be traded over the counter, which is the bulk of what your foreign exchange is, uh, over the counter meeting with your banks or your non bank providers, or via the exchanges such as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. What are some of the factors that move the market? And uh, we'll be touching on some of this in a little bit, but uh, obviously, economic news drives the market. Uh, the release of lower than expected gross domestic product numbers or trade numbers can affect the currency markets instantaneously. Uh, central bank intervention is also a key factor. Uh, movements by the Fed, European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan can move the markets. Uh, market sentiment and rumors. Uh, politics, obviously that's a big factor uh, from last night's uh, election that we'll discuss later. Funds coming into the U.S. makes the dollar stronger. And then technical analysis as a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's more for the, for the traders uh, because essentially they look at historical rates and may place their positions based on where they see historical rates going. What is currency risk? So unexpected changes in the exchange rate, well, those are the risks that it'll increase your costs, reduce your profit margins, create inconsistencies in your balance sheet, or create FX gains or losses on your income statement. And there are several products to, uh, to look at for that, but uh, real quick here, I wanted to share uh, with everybody some of the current movements in the currency market uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. 21% drop in the British pound, so lots of volatility there. Euro, uh, close to a 9% change in the currency in one year. Uh, Mexican peso is a fairly huge mover, 21% approximately. And the Canadian dollar is another large mover based on commodity levels, uh, down 14% year over year. Some of the basic products that are out there for the foreign currency uh, traders are the spot contract, which is essentially just a, a standard purchase for sale of currency to settle within one or two business days. Uh, settle between one or two business days just simply because of uh, time differences from one uh, time zone to another. Uh, so, for example, for Canadian dollars and Mexican pesos, they settle in one business days, meaning uh, if, we, if you do a deal with your bank, they debit you, and then your beneficiary receives payment the next day. Uh, other countries, such as the Eurozone or Japan, they get uh, credited within two business days due to time zone differences again. So that's your most basic transaction. The other transaction that's most basic, uh, prominently used are the forward contracts. What forward contracts are designed to do is lock in on exposure that settle uh, past spot. So anything future dated, whether it's uh, receivable or payable that you want to lock in exposure and certainty, you can lock in on what's called a forward contract. And this kind of summarizes essentially what I've mentioned, but uh, it is available in most currencies and customizable maturity dates. So. Uh, if you have an invoice that's dated for a specific date or you have receivables with terms, you can essentially match your contract to mirror those particular invoices or um, contracts. And uh, finally, the relationship between the spot and forward market is based on interest rate parity. So it makes you immune essentially from holding one currency over another. So there's an adjustment made when you lock in on a forward. And as I just mentioned, uh, forward contracts can be a fixed date, meaning they're, they can settle at an exact date to match a payable or receivable, or they can settle within a window of dates. Typically, uh, 30 days is most commonly used, but you can go as long as 90 days, depending on the financial institution you're working with. What this window forward is enable, enables you to do is essentially uh, settle up on your contract within a period of dates as opposed to one, one specific date, so it's a lot more flexible to use. Some internal considerations when dealing in foreign exchange is consider your overall corporate exposure and opportunities, meaning do a self-assessment on where you're selling into and where your opportunities arise uh, with com versus competitors or potential customers. Uh, what we recommend is uh, from a best practices perspective is devise an internal risk management policy on your exposures. Uh, what hedging tools are you gonna be utilizing? What department internally is responsible for the function? And how do you measure a successful policy? Meaning at the end of each hedging period, has your hedge been successful to what your goals are as a corporation? And again, for importers, ask about invoicing in local currency versus dollars. 
utilize dual currency invoicing when appropriate so that you can determine whether or not it's more advantageous for you to pay in local currency versus U.S. dollars. And with that, uh, I guess we leave it up to, to uh, the Q&A portion of our presentation. So, Adam? Perfect. Thanks, guys. 